Well, good morning, and welcome to Christian Life Church. If you're joining us by live stream, I want to give you a warm welcome, and also for those here in the sanctuary and in our overflow area where we have a tent, I'm Ron Satrapi, and my wife Denise and I are senior pastors here at Christian Life Church, and this morning I want to start off by just taking a moment to pray for our country. How many of you think we should pray for our country? I think so, too. And before we do that, I'd just like to... um, show a little video that just kind of reflects that. You can go ahead and play that. Heavenly Father, we lift up our nation to you right now, that you would unite us as one nation under God, and that would be reminded that no form of government can be effective without God leading and ruling the lives of those that are leading others. Father, our founding fathers knew this. Help us restore the foundations. Help us come back to the place where we recognize our need for you in our country, in our schools, in our colleges and in our everyday life. Give wisdom to our leaders, Father. May they know their need for you because, Lord, you are the beginning of wisdom. Lord, help us to establish peace in our nation among different people groups. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, this week we're celebrating the birth of our nation, and for some time now we've been witnessing an outright attack in an attempt to steal our Christian identity from our nation. And you might think, well, you know, why would anyone want to do that? Because identity determines behavior. Identity determines values. And the enemy knows that. This is not something old. It's something ancient that he's done, the strategy to knock out our Christian identity. Then you knock out how we behave and how we believe and what our values are as a nation. And we've seen people vandalizing these different statues and things. You see, the point isn't the statue or who the statue is. The point is there's an effort to rewrite history and make it in a different image. And this nation is unique in that it's the first one like it in the history of humanity. And God wants us to recognize that that was because he was involved from the very beginning. And it's time for us to get our Christian heritage back. And I hear a good amen. When we were, um, when we had a Christian school in Massachusetts and also in Alabama, we taught our Christian heritage. And it was amazing when I came back how few people really know about the founding of our nation and how many of the people that founded it were believers and that at the time it was, there was a Christian worldview, not this secular one that we, that we have right now. And you might be thinking, well, why, why would it be important for anyone to steal our identity? Why, why are people trying to destroy these statues and do all these things? Well, there's a lot more at stake. It's, a, it's because identity really determines how we're going to 
how we're going to operate. You are right now, you're acting out what you believe to be true about yourself. And if you believe that you're no good, then you're going to act no good. If you believe that you're like God, you're going to act like God. I think I'd rather act like God. How about you? Instead of no good. Our identity determines our beliefs and actions as a nation. And, and until our identity changes, our nation cannot fundamentally change. So the effort's going to be, we got to change the identity. we got to make it look like that it wasn't really a Christian nation. Well, it was, whether you want to or not. Whether you want to believe that or not, I'd encourage you to do something. Take a little walk, like I did when I moved back to New England at Harvard University. And walk around on the outside, and you'll see all of the Scripture references and all of the things that they believed then. And, you know, maybe you don't realize that Harvard, Yale, and Princeton were seminaries originally. And the most intelligent people on the planet were actually Christians. And it's really important for us to get back again to where we take our place in influencing education, take our place in influencing all of the influence centers of our nation so that we can reflect God and how he intended this world to be. Matter of fact, I want to go back and, and, and right to the beginning. That's what the, the word Genesis means. And so we want to talk today about spiritual identity theft. That's what's going on right now. Spiritual identity theft. And the enemy's up to his old tricks. You want to see how we operated? We're going to reveal that today. It's really important, but I want to show a little video clip that communicates the importance of identity first. Let's play that now. I am a student. I am a mother. A teacher. I am a leader. I'm a failure. I am un unwanted. I am felt. I am ugly. Defeated. I am third. Third. Untouchable. Stupid. I am oppressed. oppressed. I am worthless. Alone. I am a sinner. A victim. A victim. Redeemed. I am valued. I am a precious child of God. I am justified. Holy. Never alone. I am beautiful. Righteous. Accepted. I am free. Forgiven. Chosen. Made new. Loved. I am loved. Loved. I'm loved. Identity is so important that the very first chapter of human history was written about identity. In the book of Genesis in chapter 1 in verse 26 through 27 it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing aren't you glad that we have dominion over creeps that's on the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him and male and female created he them 
And it's really important to see the significance. Why did God feel like he needed to leave his impression upon mankind forever? That we reveal to others what God is like, even in our very physical features. Because identity is how God communicates who he is to the, to the world. And as a believer, he's chosen yours to do that with. That's why God made man in his image. It's the internal image that we see of ourselves. That's what identity is. And it was originally developed for us here today by those that were closest to us, that communicated to us who we were and what we were like. Remember? Image and likeness. There's a strong connection between who we are and whose we are. Really, when you really stop and think about it, when you came into this world, you knew nothing about yourself other than what other people told you. But when you get born again, you also know nothing about who you are in Christ until other people tell you. And some have told us in the Bible and Scripture. I, identity is this incredible, invisible force that controls your whole life. Tony Robbins, it says, it's like gravity, it's invisible. There's actually something controlling your life. And sometimes we think, oh, that's the enemy. No. I heard one person say, if you want to see the enemy, look in the mirror. And either you'll see who you really are or you'll see your enemy. God made man in his own image, plural. Let us, in our. You see, image and likeness is so important because how we see ourselves determines how high we can go. So if we have a high opinion of ourselves, then we can do things that wouldn't be below ourselves. And you don't get any higher than God. God knew that if man did not have the right in, image on the inside, he would not reflect the, his, God's image on the outside. Only then could man have divine-like behavior, which ultimately reflected God on the earth. Look at someone today and give them a big smile. Let them know that you're showing them God. This is what God is like. The image and likeness of the earthly domain reflected the image and likeness of the heavenly domain. So God, he's in heaven, and everyone on earth is seeing him through those that he's put here on this planet, through an image and likeness, his, that's being bore upon every man. Eric Fromm said, integrity simply means a willingness not to violate one's identity. Many ways in which such violation is possible. I think probably one of the hardest things for me to overcome before I became a believer was my disdain and hatred for myself because of things that I've done. I was the perfect self-hater. And I grew up in abuse and I felt like, you know, I was a bad person, but if I get punished, then I'll be better. But the fact of the matter is, when you punish yourself, you're just reinforcing a wrong opinion about yourself, and you're going to ultimately act out what you believe to be true about yourself. And how you see yourself is going to determine what you do with your life. You see, God's image, it didn't just come as a picture, but it came with God's blessing. The very first thing God did when he made man, bless him, be fruitful and multiply First thing God wants to do in your life is bless you, not punish you. He wants to bless you. And the blessing comes with the image. Can you say that? The blessing comes with the right image. If you want God's blessing in your life, you better make sure you got the right image on the inside, that you're made in God's image. Can you say that? I'm made in God's image. Just saying it releases faith. And Adam and Eve believed that they were like their father, God creator, and they had a great relationship with him. Can you imagine what it was like for Adam when God made Adam and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils? The Bible said he breathed into his nostrils and mouth. I'd say that's kind of an intimate connection, wouldn't you? Many people freak out nowadays if a, a dad kisses his, one of his kids on the lips, which I don't do, but some people freak out. Can you imagine if you got God hanging off your face, breathing the breath of life, showing the need for an intimate relationship with man that God would share his own breath with us? Think about that. Man was created for intimacy. In, to, me, see. What do you see? The God who created me. 
They didn't need to wear clothes because they were clothed with the glory and likeness of God. It was only after that they had sinned that they were ashamed of their physical appearance and they responded by covering themselves. They were covered with the right reflection and then they covered the wrong one. How they saw themselves on the inside had changed because of sin. Identity is the thing that predicts. It's the, the prophet of all prophets. It predicts our behavior, our character, our values, and our habits. It also determines how we relate to God and our place on earth and in society. Is it any wonder they're trying to destroy our Christian heritage? We just might start acting like Christians. Everything changed for Adam and Eve when one important thing changed. Their identity changed. Their identity, their image was broken when their image of God was falsified. This was the very first identity theft in history. The enemy told them that God was different than what God had revealed to them that he was. The devil was the one who committed it. He did that. He stole Adam and Eve's God-given identity. When he changed God's identity, then they, don't, they didn't know what to believe about themselves. In Genesis chapter 3, we see this whole account about how he did that. First of all, he made them question God's likeness and his motives with his commandment not to eat the forbidden fruit. Making them think, well, you know, God's holding out on you. You could be more than you are, but God doesn't want you to be because he's exploiting you. And they fell for it. They questioned the image of God that they knew that maybe it was different. And so they would know once they ate the tree of, from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is exactly how the enemy brought man down. He brought man down from the inside. It wasn't the fruit they ate, it was the image they broke. They had this one image of God that now is different. Now God is going to get them for that. Now they're afraid of God. They've got to hide from God. They don't have that intimate relationship with God. They've got to hide from themselves by covering themselves up. Well, we get modern-day cover-ups, don't we? And all of it has to do with how we see ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, how we think God sees us. You see... It all started off with questioning how they saw God. Had God not said, trying to change the word of God, that your eyes are going to be open and you'll be like God and you'll know good. And you, you, let, me, let me tell you what he's telling them. You can be like God without God. You can know what's right and wrong yourself. You don't any longer have to be a reflection. You can be the real thing. Now you can be God. They could be like God, but they could be like God without God. That's the major change. They could have their own version of right and wrong. Wow. Let me see, what do I want to be right? That's what's right. No longer objective. It was a total false image because they could only reflect God when they were with God. And boy, we've seen the other reflections that, they can, that, that mankind has revealed. You see, you have to be with a mirror for it to reveal your reflection. So a man is disconnected from God. He's disconnected from his very self-image of who he really is. So they were choosing to be God. And we're all trying to be God when we try to reflect him in our own ability and in our own image, making God in our own image. That's what idolatry is, isn't it, really? Self-worship. Self-exaltation. When Adam and Eve lost their God-given identity, it changed how they identified not only with God, but with each other. Number one, they hid from God, but they also hid from each other. And they hid their physical likeness from each other. This is before they had children with Adam and Eve. Their whole self-esteem changed, and they became fearful instead of faithful. This is the very first time human beings experienced fear. And I'm going to tell you something, too. They, they entered into a lot of struggles. Life was good in the garden, but now they got weeds. Life is a struggle, but don't let, Ralston Bowles says, don't let your struggle become your identity. Has your struggle become your identity? I think it can. I think if our struggle is justice or our struggle 
is poverty or our struggle, no matter what it is, don't let it identify you. That's one of the things I had to learn as a new believer. Don't identify someone broke. Identify someone blessed. But I'll tell you, I had to, it, it didn't change overnight. It took effort. Their false identity changed how they treated each other. What do you mean? Well, when they did what they weren't supposed to, what did Adam do? He blamed the woman. What did the woman do? He bl she blamed the devil. Then Adam, he really won up to her. He blamed God for giving him the woman. I mean, if that isn't dumb as a bag of hammers, I don't know what is. And see how that affected their relationship with each other. I want you to understand something. When I, when I know that I have to reflect God in my marriage, I treat my wife a whole lot different than when I don't. Does she cr see Christ in me, or does she see the first Adam? Later they gave birth to children, bearing them in Adam's broken image. And that image has been passed down generationally to all of mankind. And we're all born with a first Adam, earthly, selfish, self-seeking, false identity that was broken by the sins of mankind before us. Matter of fact, in Genesis 5.3, it says something very interesting. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness, after his own image. Not God's now, it's his now. See the change? Identity theft affected all of humankind. And he named him Seth. You see, if we hold on to our false identity, we're going to be enemies of God. And we're going to be enemies of each other. That's why they ran from God. That's why they hid from God. We will identify only with those that are like us, our gender, our race, our that have the same sexual pleasures, and try to make everybody in our image and right and wrong is whatever benefits me. We will identify with what pleases our flesh, what benefits us, and what form of justice that we think should be right. Our own revenge, even. Is it any wonder that the world is in such conflict and at odds with God and with each other? The first Adam identity is that it's the very root cause of all human conflict. All affliction. All lawlessness. We can also self-identify with being a good mother or a good father, maybe a good person in my profession, maybe I'm a good citizen. If we really think about it, aren't, aren't we just comparing ourselves to other people when we say I'm a good this or I'm a good that? You know, someone once asked me, if you died right now, do you think you'd go to heaven? And I said, well, I haven't killed anyone, I probably would. My, my identification, my comparative was a murderer, not Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life. Well, if you put me next to him, well, no, I'm going to bust hell wide open. Well, that's why he had to come. And sometimes we get into conflicts with people when they start criticizing our parenting or they start criticizing things that we say, start calling us a racist or start calling us a lefty or a righty. You see, when we respond to that, we're responding in a first Adam identity. We're not responding in our new second Adam identity. We see the importance of how we treat each other even after Noah's flood. You see, we value human life for the image of God that it bears. Not for the color, not for the nationality or gender, not for the sexual preference, not for the political party, but for the image that we reflect of God even if it's only in the natural, in the physical. We honor all, not because we agree with them, but because we honor God's image that they bear. That's why human life is so valuable. That's why the unborn are so valuable. They bear the image of God. To do something against them is to do something against God. They are put here for a purpose, to accomplish something for God, and one of those things is to, is to reveal His image on this world. In Genesis 9, 6, it said, whoever so sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he was made. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Everybody here can connect with bearing the image of God. Maybe we don't connect by color. Maybe we don't connect by 
economics. Maybe we don't connect by educational status. Maybe we don't connect in a lot of other ways, but that's not what we're to connect to. We're connect, we connect because we're connected with God. It's not about who I am. It's about whose I am. And we get caught up in the, the who I am, and, and, and we, we forget all about, all about the whose I am. I'm here to reflect him, not me. I'm not here to reflect the first Adam. I'm here to reflect the second Adam. And we have to choose the right identity. 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 15, 45 says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Can you say living being? That means he was physically alive. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Not life-taking. A life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And after, afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as in the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. As we have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Wow. So every one of us here, we bear to the image of the first Adam in the physical realm. And we bear the image of the second Adam because we've been born spiritually. How do you get rid of a bad identity? God had the perfect plan. Come down and kill it. Jesus said, pick up your death instrument and follow me. When we pick up our cross, we die to the old first Adam way of thinking, first Adam values, first Adam self-centered, earthy way of doing things, and now we're going to start doing things that reflect God, thinking in ways that reflect God, living our lives in ways that reflect God. We're not going to get involved with the world and play the way they play. We're going to play by a whole different set of terms and a whole different set of rules because we're here to reflect God. We're not here to get ours. You have to forgive me if I start preaching. So we all bear that Adam, that first Adam image at birth. And we're born with that sinful nature, that broken image. Like Adam, we become earthly living beings. And when we're born spiritually, we bear the image of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Like Christ, we become heavenly life-giving spirits. Are you giving life in your relationships? We shall bear the image of the heavenly man and in Christ, we no longer bear the image of skin color, political party, nationality, or economic status. I mean, you take all those away, and some of us wouldn't have any identity at all. Well, that's the whole idea of the cross, is to take all of those away so that we now identify as people made in the image of God here to reflect him. When we identify with the earthly first Adam, we identify with sin. And we're seeing a lot of that. When we identify with the second Adam, Jesus Christ, we identify the heavenly and we walk in victory. Thanks be to God, we've been given the victory. We're not trying to get it. We've been given the victory through Jesus Christ. You see, we tend to identify a lot of times with our struggles. And I think Adam probably had a lot of that after he got kicked out of the garden. You heard the one about Adam and the kids are on the outside of the garden looking across the river and Adam says to the kids, yeah, that's where we used to live before your mom made us out of house and home. It's a joke, but men are still blaming women. And we see a lot of conflict because of that. That's why we need to get back to, to the second Adam and how we respond to things. You see, God sees our struggle, but God uses that to make us stronger and make us draw more from him and in the second Adam. Struggling is not the identity. You must learn to live while you struggle such that anyone who sees you can separate the struggle from your life. A lot of people struggling. Are they seeing Jesus? Or are they just seeing your struggle and how bad you have it and poor old pity me? Are you having a poor old pity me party or a praise God party? I think it's time for praise God party. In 1 Corinthians 15, Verses 50 through 58, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. First, Adams can inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does 
flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How many of you are glad when you're going to be changed? I'm looking for a nice 32-year-old body when Jesus comes back and all the dead in Christ are resurrected or those that are still around. I'm looking for that transformation, 160-pound guy. In the moment, we're going to be changed. It says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible has been put on, has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I don't know about you, but I read the end of the book and we win. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. Now, I want you to get this. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. The law was sent as a shadow of Christ. The law shows you what's right, but the Spirit of Christ empowers you to live right. There's a big difference there. The law was the image of a stone. Jesus is the very image of God. You see, laws can't change us. Only Jesus can change us. And he does that by giving us a new image on the inside. The law was a shadow of the new self-image to come. This is how you're going to be. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. You're not going to bear false witness. This is an, just a predictor of the new image called you in Christ. The law revealed to every man that he has lost the image of God and cannot in his own ability produce the actions of righteousness. He could identify with right and wrong, but he could not perform it apart from God, which is part of the problem with Adam and Eve. They wanted to be able to do it without God, remember? The image of God in the heart produces the outward actions that reveal God. You see, until you see yourself on the inside differently, you can't act any differently on the outside. That's why you have to die. That's why Jesus said, pick up your death instrument and follow me. That when you die to the old way, that's, you, don't, you don't erase the old identity, you replace the old, the old with the new. And so Jesus becomes your new identity. He's the one now in you that when you look and you see yourself, it's like Adam did when he looked into the face of God. Now we're back to seeing ourselves as God intended us to be, made in his image, in his likeness. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image. Here we go, the image. The law didn't have the image. We need the image. Going to change the action? We need the image. Change image, change action. Change image, change beliefs. Change life. For the law, having a shadow of things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. So what he's saying here is that the Jews that were following the law, that was not God what's going to make them perfect. What was going to make them perfect the was actions. the shadow. No, it was the thing that cast the shadow, and his name is Jesus. He fulfilled the law, remember? For they would not have ceased to be offered, for worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin every year, for it is impossible that the, bull, the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will. Jesus brought his image into your life as a believer so that you could perform the will of God. He took away that old stony heart. Remember the Bible talks about that, the stony heart, and replaced it with a heart of flesh? What, what are you talking about? He took away the wrong dead image and gave you a real live one. Wow, that's a powerful thing. He said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He took away the first Adam, that he could establish the second Adam. 
Man, I'm going to tell you, this is rich when you really get into it. God's image in the heart is what the new covenant is really all about. God's image, the image of Christ, who comes into the heart of true believers. That's why we need to start seeing ourselves the way God says we are. All the problems we're seeing in the world are false identity problems. Racism, social, social injustice, crime, political conflict, economic disparity. They're all the conflicts that result in man trying to be God instead of man trying to reflect God. We're not here to be God. We're here to reflect God. There are, there are and always will be problems like this because of sinful man, because he wants to be God, he wants to be in control. Jesus Christ is the answer to what needs to change in our nation and in the heart of every man who's been restored by the image. It changes his character, changes its values, changes its behavior. It changes his heart. How many of you have had some changes since Jesus Christ came into your life? There are no first Adam remedies. I want you to understand something. I love this country, but it's not the remedy. Jesus Christ is the remedy. There are no first Adam remedies. If there are first Adam remedies, then Jesus died in vain. The first Adam worshiped with animal sacrifices and shed blood that covered his sin. Jesus, the second Adam, he became a human sacrifice, not like an animal, a human sacrifice. And he shed his blood, and the blood of the Lamb of God is of a much higher level than the blood of animals. And without the blood, without shed blood, there can be no removal. It says remittance, or remit, remitted our sins. They covered the sins in the Old Testament. Jesus removed them in the New Testament. Well, what do you mean? It means that when you follow God, you can actually live the way God wants you to live and reflect him in the life here. And accordingly, the law, almost all things are purified by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there'll be no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copy of these things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with much better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not come. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest did, they, they did offerings once a year, but Jesus did once for all. And he enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have suffer often since the foundation of the world but now once at the end of the ages he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself this is a powerful thing when you really get a hold of it and I'm out of time I'm going to have to continue next week but I want you to understand Jesus paid for our sins by dying for them so that we would no longer have to live like the first Adam he came into our hearts to bring the removal of sin by changing our identity and make our identity in him. We once bore the sinful image of the first Adam, and now we bear the image of the second, Jesus Christ. Wow. Our inner image change in identity took place when Jesus Christ came into our lives. His image changes us as we look by faith into the mirror of God's word and reflects his image to a sinful, dying, and hopeless world. Folks, that's what we're here to do. This is our time. This is our hour. It's time to quit reflecting the first Adam. And maybe you're here today and you realize, I've been reflecting the first Adam, and you need to, you need to replace the old with the new. You need to realize that your purpose here is to show what God is like, and for some of them, you're the only thing like God they'll ever see. And if you want God to really do something powerful in your life, I want to encourage you. Ask Jesus to come into your life. Start reflecting his image. Quit looking to try to establish your own and make yourself important some other way. No, my friend, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're going to look for other things to make you important instead of him. And I think it's important that if 
we need to ask Jesus into our heart that we do that today. Can we just bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer? Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for every one of us. We want to have a second Adam identity. We want people to see you in our lives. The first Adam was earthly and selfish and self-centered, fearful, combative, and argumentative. We want to be like Jesus, the heavenly, self-sacrificing, faithful, peacemaking, long-suffering, reconciling one. Pray this prayer with me if that's what you want. You want the second Adam. You want Jesus' image in your life. Pray, pray this with me. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I want Jesus to come into my life and help me to live for you. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead so that I could be saved from sin and hell and become a child of God. I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for me and you're watching my video today, I want to encourage you to just go online here with our church app. You'll find a, a Connect card on the church app. And by going to the More tab and then click Connect Card, and under Comments, let me know that you prayed that prayer with us today so that I can be praying for you. And we have Connect Cards here that you can let us know here if you're here in the, in the sanctuary with us as well. And if you prayed that prayer, God heard that. You can if, fill out that Connect Card too, and that we'll be able to send you the notes for each week's teaching that you can follow along with us from home or from here. As we prepare to give our offering, I want to ask you if there's anybody here in the sanctuary who needs an offering envelope, if you raise your hand, the ushers will bring you one. And if you'd like to give financially to support our ministry so that it can continue, you can do that on our app by going to the More tab and then select Give. And on the website, by going to the Give tab, then collect Donation on the drop-down. You can also give by texting, G-I-V-E-C-L-C. -C, and you can send that to 1-888-364-GIVE. You can also send a check or credit card number to us. And I'd like to make a contribution by mail to Christian Life Church on 775 Harold L. Dow Highway in Elliott, Maine. Now, I want to just share a little bit about offering and, and how important it is to, re to, to reflect God in our, in our finances in our giving. You know, if you ask psychiatrists, would you rather do some psychological tests or would you rather see someone's checkbook? They'd pick the checkbook every time. Because your spending reflects your values. Your spending reflects what's important to you. And I think it's important that our giving reflect that Jesus Christ is important to us and other people knowing him is important to us. You see, Jesus had a life-giving spirit. And when we give financially, we're giving to help others find real life in Jesus Christ. And if you know him, then you want to make him known. Partner together with us so that we can reveal Christ to those that don't have any hope. who are being tormented by the fear of the enemy. I just can't imagine what it's like going through all that's happening in our nation right now and not having the support of God, the support of other believers. As we worship the Lord in our giving, I'm going to just pray over the offering. Let's pray over God's offering here. Fa Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the offering as we're about to give today. We want to faithfully support your kingdom's work so that it can continue and thrive. Amen. I encourage those of you who may have gotten behind in your giving, it would be a good time to get caught up so that we can do what God's called us to do together. Because this is what we're doing together. This isn't what I'm doing or Denise. This is what we're doing. And I want to Thank you for joining us today here in the sanctuary or in our overflow tent or by live stream. If you'd like to visit us for a live service, you can make a reservation on our church app by going to the event tab. You'll see the first service or second service. Or if you get our weekly email, you can respond by clicking the reservation button or calling the office at 207-449-3824. The first 50 people can meet in the sanctuary for each service and the next 50 
can meet in our tent overflow. We can have 100 reservations in the 9 a.m. and 100 people in the 11 a.m., 50 in each location. To our live stream audience, I want to thank you for being with us this morning. Please know that you're in our hearts and prayers, and we look forward to being with you soon. Be sure to keep us posted on any prayer requests that you may have. Until then, I want to say thanks for being with us. God bless you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Church Online today. You can catch the playback of this entire broadcast later on today on Facebook or YouTube. Or if you want to download the entire broadcast on Tuesday, you can get it on our church app found as Christian Life Church Maine in your app store. Guys, you're important and you matter to us and we want to stay connected to you. So if you have a prayer request, if you want someone to reach out to you, if you need information, or if you want to join any of our Zoom group chats that are going to happen throughout the week, then just shoot us an email at citlchurches.com, and we'd be happy to get you the information and connect with you. I know it might be easy to feel a little isolated in our homes during this challenging season, but we want you to know that you are never isolated or cut off from the love of God and from his power and protection. And we're praying that you will stay connected to him and to us all week long. Be blessed, everybody.